to my soul. He, all my griefs have taken, and all my sorrows borne. In temptation, he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken, and all my idols torn from my heart, and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me, and Satan tempt me sore, Jesus, I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here, while I live by faith and do his blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With his manna he may hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. There is fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Thank you, brother. Well, good evening. Good evening, church. Good evening, Turpins. So good to see everybody. Thank you all for coming on other, any side that you're at. Uh, truly, it's good to see everybody. I hope that you're having a great week. Let's look to the Lord. Ask him to do something special. It's going to be a great night in his house. Father, we thank you. Lord, your grace is always so good to us. Thank you for bringing us here. Lord, thank you for allowing us this opportunity to worship you and to learn from your word. God, I pray that as we're here tonight that we would love and encourage one another and that we would provoke one another to good works and to glorify your holy name and open our hearts, pour in your grace, and help us to be more like your son, Jesus Christ, tonight. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. All right. Take that songbook again. Remain standing. Turn to page 228. Brother Sean, you got it. All right. 228. I love to tell the story. We do have a story to tell.
Thank you. You may be seated. So as we get ready for our prayer requests, um, I've asked Sean to kind of give us an update on his experiences um, and, a, and a recent trip that he took, and I don't want to steal any of his thunder, but we're going to hear from Sean, uh, kind of our in-house missionary, I guess you'd say, and um, let him share some of his perspective, and then we'll take some prayer requests as usual and continue on the service. So brother, you come and share some things. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> All right, so last, excuse me. Amen. <clears throat> excuse me. Last week I was in Poland. I went there on the 23rd annual uh, Baltic Sea Military Chaplain Conference. So a chaplain from all the Baltic nations. So we had uh, chaplains from Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, um, uh, Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, <laughs> Poland, uh, uh, Germany, and the United States. Uh, so we had all those uh, chaplains uh, that were over there. Um, so just a couple highlights. One of the things that really, Im really impressed me is we started every, every day with what, what they would call, they call it prayer, devotions, and we had several prayer meetings, if you will. And the thing that really kind of affected uh, uh, me in a, a good kind of way is uh, that these were people, these were chaplains who loved the Lord. Uh, in fact, the, the, the different nations in Europe tend to do chaplaincy a little bit different. They're not quite as professionalized, if you will, as our chaplains uh, here in America. For better or worse, we can discuss that part. Uh, but regardless, uh, these, are, these are people who really love the Lord and are preaching the gospel uh, to their troops. And it was the, the way they divide up chaplaincy in the most European countries is they actually have a, a uh, predominantly um, Catholic chaplaincy with the head of that division, if you will. And then they have the um, evangelical chaplaincy, and they have the head of that. This organization that puts together this, uh, the 23rd annual uh, Baltic Sea Military Chaplain Conference, they're from the evangelical uh, chaplains, if you will, from all these, from all these countries. And so just the, 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 um, the blessing it was to be able to sing and to pray with all these chaplains uh, from all these different countries, even though they were praying in their own, uh, in their own language and even reading scripture in their own language, uh, English was the common language that everybody everybody knew as well. I remember the verse from uh, when Elijah was, was thinking, you know, Lord, I'm all alone and nobody else is is really uh, serving you at all. And uh, no, actually, there are a lot of people who are, are serving me. God said, and uh, it, it was just really a blessing to be uh, uh, with that group of people. Um, I ask your prayer for um, uh, the uh, the Russian. Uh, excuse me, the Ukrainian chaplain that came and spoke to us. Um, now, Ukraine actually only has two chaplains in their military, um, and the rest are all volunteers. And these volunteers are not even that theologically trained. Again, they do chaplaincy a little different over there, not as professional as we are. And this particular chaplain is a female chaplain whose name was Elena. And in a sense, I kind of see her as like when we have missionaries who go out and really they're just trying to share the gospel with people. And she talked about all the different opportunities that she had to share the gospel with frontline troops there in Ukraine. She uh, even established uh, with uh, some friends of theirs, um, friends of hers, a uh, mobile dental team that they went forward to front lines to take care of the teeth and then, and then she would hold Bible studies, she would talk to people, she would pray with people, and was and doing volunteer chaplain work. She said her whole goal is to point people to the Lord and to share the gospel with people, and that people would repent of their sins and would come to know the Lord even in the midst of this trauma and difficulty. Um, and uh, she gave a talk uh, for us on chaplains' response to total war uh, because uh, we in America haven't really experienced total war uh, in our lifetime, um, but in Ukraine, they are. They're experiencing their, their, their people. And, and there's this family also that if you could pray for, um, the lady's name is Natalia. Um, they used to attend a Baptist church in Ukraine. And, um, <clears throat> and she and her 12-year-old uh, daughter, Amelia, they uh, fled the country. Um, their husband 
uh, Alexander is still back in Ukraine um, doing uh, civil work. He's not actually in the military, but doing civil work, keeping you know the economy and the and the and the and the system flowing for supplies for the military and stuff. Um, but um, but they had to flee their country. She used to Natalia used to uh, uh, work as a as an English teacher and uh, and a Polish teacher in Ukraine, and they had to leave their church, the people they love, their pastor that they really appreciated, and their pastor from Ukraine, their Baptist church. He went and became a volunteer chaplain and went and served on the front line. And he left his his congregation. I mean, everything's chaos over there. Everything's crazy. Everything's different. People are leaving their normal jobs and going to serve on the front line in whatever type of capacity they can. And so pray for that family, you know, if you would. Um, you know, it's a new environment for them. They're refugees. They haven't seen their dad uh, in, in, um, in a long time. Uh, and so, and she's actually helping out with this Evangelical Lutheran Church now there in Poland and other refugees uh, from uh, from uh, uh, from Ukraine, as and as as she was telling me this story, I was just thinking to myself how good we have it. You know, we think that we have trials and difficulties, but you know, our our homeland is not being attacked. You know, we're not being separated from our family by force, not knowing if we're ever going to see our loved one again because they're being attacked by missiles and bombs every day. Um, you know, just. So pray, pray for Natalia, Alexander, and Amelia, and then for the chaplain, uh, Elena, uh, uh, there as she continues to just to preach the gospel. And she's totally volunteer. She's not getting paid nothing at all uh, for, uh, for the work uh, that they're doing. It's a, it's a rough situation over there. They share how one of their, um, this lady, Natalia, I'll just share one more story. Um, <clears throat> one of her friends is a psychologist, a child psychologist. We're staying in, in Ukraine, helping children overcoming the trauma of sexual assault by the Russian soldiers. And just imagine, and that's not something you can ever undo or unsee or anything. And the, the things that the children are being faced over there, according to these eyewitness uh, reports that we're getting, is just incredible. And so, so anyway, so just pray for this family, if you would. All right. <clears throat> okay. Wow. Well, let's pray for our um, Baltic chaplains and for the families and the volunteers uh, in Ukraine. That's. Uh, I'm sure there's many more stories that you that you could share, and uh, but those. Wow, well, talk about living by faith. And I'm also amazed, and, and I don't know if I should be or not, but. Boy, there's so many different ways that people have creatively found to share the gospel with people, even in the most dramatic and intense and chaotic situations. Um, you know, it's, it's not just pastoring, teaching, and being a missionary. God, God uses all kinds and all sorts of different ways to spread his word and spread his gospel, and it's amazing that um, we get to hear about that and that you got to see, meet, actually meet somebody that's doing that, boy. <clears throat> it's going to be neat hearing the rest of the story in heaven one day. You know, it's going to be going to be really interesting. So pray for uh, Ukraine. <coughs> Anybody have any prayer requests? Yes. Yes, yes. So not to not to brag or anything, but the army chaplains, uh, they do they do have a piece in this, and um, it's been real interesting to uh, to be able to to hear about that. It's nice they're doing good work, especially if it's recognized by navy chaplains. So that's nice nice that you acknowledge our presence over there. I'm just we're teasing each other. If you can't see his face, he's happy that I'm picking on him. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Prayer requests. Anybody? Yes, Quincy. Okay, and you're going to the uh, summer counseling, or the summer camp to do counseling, yes. <gasps> mm. Glad your mama ain't in here to hear that. 
<clears throat> yes, pray for Quincy, pray for his family, and he's packing, uh, not just for summer, but for his uh, follow-on uh, assignment with, uh, with college. <clears throat> I apologize for my coughing. Okay, anybody else? Yes, Amber. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, we'll be praying for some clear weather there. Okay. Okay, is he still AGR? Is he still doing that? Okay. Oh, for the honor guard, okay. Okay. Okay, we will be praying for those. Anybody else? Nope, just playing with our hair, okay. Just making sure, making sure. <clears throat> well, pray for me. Um, I don't even know what to tell you about my bronchitis, and it's here. It's, it's been here. Um, I assess with high confidence it will continue to be here for some time. Um, <clears throat> so pray for that. Pray for my eyes. Um, so I had an eye exam today, and my eyes are dilated, so we're going to see how well I read these notes tonight. Amen? It could be really short. It could be really long. Hard to tell. <clears throat> but your prayers will make the difference. That's not a threat, that's a promise. <laughs> I hope I can read them. Because, you know, I'm, I, like, I like to think about and write down what I'm going to say before, before I say it. And that may mean absolutely nothing tonight. So we'll see. So you pray for me. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> next week, actually, this, well, however you want to think about this. Sunday afternoon, um, me and my family, we are going away for a little trip to Virginia. We're going to get out of town. We're going to put some uh, miles on that new beautiful vehicle that you bought for us. And so I thought, it was, I thought it was the least I could do to make sure that this thing is broken in. <clears throat> that way I can protect your investment, okay? You're not smiling enough, and so I just want to say I appreciate that. But we'll be out of town for a few days, and so pray for us. And we'll be back. We're not going to miss any church or any services like that. But also, um, we'll get back on Wednesday, be here for church, then Thursday... Uh, Lisa and I will be going to uh, fly to Florida to attend Paul Houck's funeral. And so we'll express our deepest condolences to our friends uh, while we're down there um, on behalf of the church uh, to express our condolences for, uh, for Brother Paul. <clears throat> and so we'll be back Saturday. So it's going to be a, a busy, um, it's going to be a busy traveling week. And then we'll be, we'll be in for a week, and then I, I have annual training with the Army coming up in June, June 3rd through the 17th. And so um, pray for that. Also, um, I'm supposed to be done on the 17th, and my flights are supposed to be on time. And if, uh, if you know anything about my flights, that may mean absolutely nothing. But in all seriousness, um, I will need someone, if anyone can help, please let me know. I need someone to pick me up from the airport on the 17th. I do not know the times. I've submitted what I wanted, which may or may not mean anything. Um, so I will have to let you know. But it will probably be from get picked up at Wilmington. And I know for some that's a long drive. So just things to think about. If you can help out with that, <coughs> let me know. My wife won't be able to pick me up that day. And so, um, yes, okay. Anybody else prayer requests before? Yes, Lynn.
for Lynn's parents <coughs> as they pray about direction and provision, um, especially as their son <coughs> excuse me, moves out, um, and they look at um, how they can afford their home and what they may need to do as a result of that. Okay, anybody else? Don't want to miss anybody. Okay, well, let's find a prayer partner, and we'll pray together. We'll come back in a few minutes and sing, sing a verse of a song and then continue right along with our service.
Let's all stand and sing one verse of Amazing Grace. It's number 244 if you need the hymn book. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. One verse only. All right, first and last. you may be seated. We're in Proverbs chapter 22 tonight. Proverbs chapter 22. We'll <clears throat> take a look and reference several passages from the book of Proverbs that will start here in Proverbs chapter 22 and bring it all full circle here by the end. <clears throat> So it sounds like most of you are there. So Proverbs chapter 22, verse number 6, famously says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Tonight we're going to talk about how to train up a child, or really wisdom for the family, if I can have a subtitle, you know what I'm saying. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you. <clears throat> God, thank you for the family. Thank you for the family of God. Lord, I pray that... You'll pour grace into our families, and Lord, I pray that as we examine your word, you'll give us wisdom and understanding and help us to make correct application, and we pray this, that we may do all these things for your glory, <clears throat> for it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Your life is the pattern followed by your children. Now, I want you to consider some things with me. Just statistically speaking, I know we can all find anecdotes, so I'm heading off at the pass any potential objections to my statistics, but it bears out in study after study that statistically speaking, children follow their parents into their habits, traits, and characteristics. For example, parents who drink alcohol, raise children who do the same to the tune of four times the general population. It means if you put a family that abuses alcohol and a family that does not abuse alcohol, the kids are four times more likely to abuse alcohol in their lives. That is true across the board. Yes, there are kids that become alcoholics that were never exposed in their home. There's an anecdote for you. And the opposite is also true. Kids that saw their parents doing the alcohol and abuse, doing alcohol abuse, and yet go up and grow up and say, no, I'm not going to do that. I understand the anecdotes. Nevertheless, they're four times more likely. This is also the case with other traits as well. Other study, studies have shown that even in positive Sorry, ways, could you say that again? I'm going to, I don't will. worry. <clears throat> You're welcome. <clears throat> the devil's fighting me all over the place tonight. As I was saying, how you parent is going to have an effect on your children. For example, if your parents set high expectations for you, you probably did better in school, right? That seems reasonable. If your mom went to high school or to college, you were more likely to do the same, including go to high school or go to college. Again, anecdotes aside. If your parents taught you to verbalize your feelings, okay, that is to be emotionally intelligent, to be self-aware, if you were taught to verbalize your feelings, can I caveat that and say in a healthy way? Because, I, I mean, we've all had some parents that verbalize their feelings, okay? Let me add, in a healthy way, all right? If you learned how to do that, 
you are less likely to get divorced. If your parents made you do chores, or can I say if your parents are making you do chores, um, which is great, which is great to do, then you are more likely to take on tasks individually, meaning you hate group projects, right? Because there's always that one kid that is not going to do anything and just get the easy A because the other three people in the group decided to work hard and do well, right? <clears throat> I guess I was the only one that didn't like that other kid. Okay. <clears throat> All of this can be wrapped up in an American proverb, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. We can all look at ourselves and say, yeah, I do have some characteristics of my parents. It's true. You, as teenagers, you deny it. You do not want to admit it. But as you get older, you will hear your parents coming out of your mouth. And it'll catch you off guard and you'll say, that's what my mom used to say. That's what my dad used to say. Now, you won't admit it. But another five, ten years go by and you'll say, mom, I said exactly what you said today. It came out of my mouth. And then all the parents will go, finally, our prayers are answered. you got a kid that's just like you, right? <clears throat> it all suffices to say that parents are role models, for better or for worse, because all of these are learned behaviors. We're not talking about eye color or receding hairlines or anything like that. We're talking about learned behavior, all right? Now, please, up front, do not make the mistake that by thinking that only your words matter, okay? Words matter, but words and instruction go together with actions. Those two are bonded because you can say the right things, instruct in the right ways, but that doesn't mean that that automatically conveys the lifestyle of following Christ that we want to uh, in invest in our kids, <clears throat> we have to understand that words and instruction are great, but they are always bonded with actions. In fact, one chapter over in Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 26, Solomon will say to his son, My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. They are watching for better or for worse, at every age and stage, even as adults, even when they're out of their house, even when they're married, uh, they're looking to see, is this really the kind of adult that I want to be? Now, I want you to do this for me real quick, all right? <clears throat> Whether on paper or in your mind or on your phone, unless you're um, too tempted to do that, and I'm being serious, you know, on paper, in your mind, on your phone, make a list of your strongest characteristics, Okay, whatever you think you're just awesome at. I, I'll give you permission to be prideful in church, okay, in case you're worried about that. <clears throat> think about, hey, these are the things I'm, I'm good at. God has gifted me. I have these characteristics. I'm really good. I'm consistent in these areas. You know, it might not be, you know, you may be able to do great things, but I also want you to balance that by thinking about what your weakest areas are. The things that you're just not good at. I can build a house, but I can't fold a fitted sheet. At least that's a story I heard recently. <clears throat> and if you're on Facebook and everyone's already looking, and so I'm just going to let you, if you don't know, you can find out in the lobby, okay? But I'm just going to say on the record, dude, those fitted sheets are crazy, and men did not invent them, and they should probably, we should just find a better solution. I will commission the government to find a better solution to those things. It's insane. All right, rant over. <clears throat> think about your strengths. Now think about your weaknesses. Now to be careful how I word this, okay, but your spouse let them come up with their own strengths and weaknesses. Okay, don't be like, hey, you really stink at this. That's not the point of this exercise, okay? <clears throat> but take those lists, your strengths and your weaknesses, your spouse's strengths and weaknesses. Combine those together. That's your kid. That's it. The best of you, the worst of you. It's all merged together. We are, our children are a product of our one flesh union. They are living demonstrations of the oneness that we have theologically, practically, and personally in our lives with our spouse. So <clears throat> in the spirit of Proverbs 20, 22, 6, train up a child the way that he should go, there's things that everyone in the household can do, parents together, husbands, wives, and even children to make sure that this home and future homes, the homes of our children now, 
will not depart from the faith. Because whatever pattern it is you're making now, in word and instruction and in action, you will mostly carbon copy that. It won't be exact. People will grow up and do their own thing to a certain extent. But we are shaping the future. These years, these few years, and some of us are running out of years to influence our kids directly every day in the home. These truly are life-shaping opportunities. Now, I know it might feel as though these high-commitment, uh, child-rearing years will never end, but they will. Some of you, it's ending sooner than you think. Uh, as you look back in your mind, you say, man, where did the time go? And that's the question. That's the perspective to keep in mind. Where did the time go? Because now is the time. If you are raising kids, now is your time. It's your time. Right now is your moment to make an enduring impact. <clears throat> There's more at stake for your kids and for my kids than just getting into the best schools or getting a scholarship or, or being the best at sports or even getting the best jobs. Our kids have eternal destinies and they will wind their way through this journey called life with the Lord or without him to reach their destiny. But if we want them to do the things which God has called us to do, then we must do the thing that God has called us, uh, called us to do, and that is to train up our children to go on the path to heaven. Now, if they're saved, they're going to get to heaven. I'm just worried about every mile marker in between now and then. Because ultimately, the way that we should go and the way that he should go, according to the text, is the way to heaven. It is the way of righteousness, the way of wisdom. <clears throat> so how do we help our children get there? Well, the word translated train up literally in the strictest sense means to dedicate. You dedicate your child to Christ. And I don't mean a cute ceremony when they're six weeks old, okay? And that's charming and I don't have a problem with that, but that's not the, the start and end of dedication. We dedicate our child to Christ by doing some things and not doing some things. I will tell you, don't raise them for the American dream. Now, I don't have a problem with uh, striving to have a good job or uh, owning a house or owning a piece of land. That's not what I'm talking about. The American dream is no longer simply owning a home. The American dream is having more and more and more of the stuff that you want and desire. I've referred to this in other sermons as the rat race, and nobody wins the rat race. What was the prodigal son caught up in? You can say all sorts of stuff. In a summary, it was the rat race. He left the father's house to go out into the world to, to spend his money, actually spend his father's money, to, to, to waste his living, to, to spend it on anything that brought satisfaction to him. And at first, it was just clothes. A anyone going clothes shopping in here lately? Anything sinful, I'm, I'm glad you've gone clothes shopping, quite frankly, and, and I'm sure you're glad that I went clothes shopping. I'm not talking about just going shopping. It's not of the devil. It's actually something that's very useful and helpful. But what I'm trying to tell you is this guy bought the most opulent clothes he could afford. He, he went to go buy the most plush accommodations that money could buy. And then it was never enough. And then when he hit rock bottom, he came to his senses and he realized everything that he wanted in the first place was right there in his father's house. That he already would have had, that he had access to the ring and the roast and the new Reeboks, everything that he wanted right there in the home he should have never left in the first place. Because everything that we want in this parable is described as having everything we need in God. People that live without God will chase all the stuff in this world. It's the rat race. Don't teach them to, uh, uh, to, to acquire the stuff for the new American dream. Te in fact, warn them against the American dream. Teach them to be dedicated to Jesus Christ. Let me put it like this. Many kids were raised in church, but not many of them were raised in Christ. And there's a difference I love church. Jesus died for the church. But of the three primary institutions that God created, the home, the government, and the church, the primary daily uh, aspect of our lives is, in fact, the home. And the home is the center of Christian learning because it is the center of Christian living. If you want your kids 
to grow up in Christ, then that takes place in your house. I will help, I will accommodate, I will lead us in worship, I will gather us together under the word, I will do everything in my power, I will counsel, I will lead, I will mentor, I will coach, but moms and dads, it's on you at the end of the day. In fact, it's on you at the beginning of the day. Dedicate them to Christ. And you know the best way to dedicate your kids to Christ? Dedicate yourself to Jesus Christ. Now, children can sense hypocrisy immediately, but they can also sense sincerity. And I'm thankful. You know, many children, in fact, every child I know, does not expect perfection. If they do, we can fix that. Just be imperfect around them enough, they'll get the signal. <laughs> they, they, can, they can understand, hey, no one's perfect, and we're trying. And if when we try and we fail and we go back and say, hey, I blew it, I messed up, I apologize, and we, and we specifically state what we did wrong, then they will understand that. Believe it or not, they will understand. <clears throat> but they know sincerity. And they will know if we have a sincere passion for Jesus Christ. And so what does that lead us to do? Parents, adults, aunts, uncles, la di da everybody, have a passion for Christ. And, and let me go a step further and say, don't be ashamed to express that passion. If Jesus is more than just your Savior, but he's the friend that you talk to, then talk to him uh, throughout the day. Talk to him with your kids. Talk to him with your spouse. And make him a part of your life. If he's the center of your home, then make him a realistic, true aspect of your home. Incorporate him into everything. He's not the third wheel. He is the wheel. He's the one that drives us and directs us and guides us. Make it real. Show your passion for him. You know, if you had a prayer request and God answered your prayer, don't keep it to yourself. If you're praying about something, you're burdened about something, share that with the family. If you're concerned about what's going on in your life or the life of somebody else, then, then pray. Pray through that. Talk about that. If you see somebody getting into some trouble, educate, teach, and mentor on that in the name of Jesus Christ. And dedicate yourself to that. Dedicate yourself to his teachings and be enthusiastic about it. Because the kids need to taste and see that the Lord is good that we have a strong confidence in him, and that he is our refuge. In fact, that's what Proverbs 14, 26 says. In the fear of the Lord, uh, we have a, a strong confidence, and his children will have a refuge. I want my kids to have a refuge. The greatest legacy any of us can leave for our kids is to show them how to find refuge in God when everything goes bad, or even when everything is on the line. There will be times of intense anguish in their life and in our lives, and we can't stop that from happening to them. We can't prevent it. We can only warn them and, and advise them that life, believe it or not, only gets harder and harder. Oh, it's going to be easier next week? You don't actually know that. You just hope it's going to be easier next week. Life gets harder and harder. And I hate to say this, it's sad, but it's true, and I feel this in my core, but it's, it's painfully true. If you think it's hard now, it only gets harder. That's not a speech for graduation, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it is true. We have to teach our kids to draw incredible, out-of-this-world supernatural strength from one source, and that's God. Because they will suffer. They will. So we better teach them where to go when they do suffer. They need to know where to find their refuge. And if we, as parents, don't passionately and enthusiastically <clears throat> embrace that reality, then they won't be able to. Now, parents, that's what you can do. I'm going to zero in on husbands for a second and wives for a second and then kids for a second because I, I take every opportunity for every target. <clears throat> Gentlemen, those of you who are husbands preparing to be husbands, which would probably be everybody in here, cultivate and nurture your wife. You can go over to Proverbs chapter 31. We'll see this here in a second. Now, some of us might be feeling right up front, I haven't trusted and valued or affirmed my wife the way that she deserves. And I appreciate that perspective, okay? <clears throat> Don't be hard on yourself, but do be honest with yourself. Now, I want to go back to brass tacks, just the simplest, simplest thing. The spouse of a wife is called a husband. 
what does the word husband mean? As far as it relates in English, it relates to the word husbandry, which means cultivation. In a word, husband, it's not just a noun, it's a verb. We cultivate. What do husbands cultivate? Our wives and our homes. Our calling as husbands is to cultivate and nurture our wives so that the lifetime effect on our wife should be that she will open her uh, uh, that she will open her mouth and she will open her heart and her life opens up more and more and more and more and she will feel that she was enabled to become all that God wanted her to become so God is calling you as her husband to care for her that in the latter years of her life she'll say wow what a great life I've had a great life. My husband understood me. He cared for me. He inspired me to grow in Christ. Now, the operative uh, question is how? How do we do that, right? <clears throat> well, of course, it's not by browbeating our wives. God doesn't treat us that way, so nor should we treat our wives that way. But it's by encouraging her. Now, Proverbs chapter 31. Let's read verses 28 through 30. Her children arise up, excuse me, her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Now key in on verse 29 here, many daughters have done virtually, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Now who is speaking in verse number 29? Do you see the, the, ta- the change in tone and the change in direct or uh, evocative uh, uh, address? One is just a broad statement, but verse 29 is a husband speaking to his wife. He's looking at her and saying, many women, many daughters have done virtu- vir- uh, excuse me, virtuously, but thou excellest them all. He's saying, y- you have done amazing things. So gentlemen, here's the question. How has your wife excelled? Because she's awesome at some things, and it's up to us to tell her how excellent she is. Where does she excel? Tell her that. And tell her in front of the kids. Tell her tonight at the dinner table. Tell her tomorrow night at the dinner table. Tell her every day of her life how excellent she is. She's not just so excellent because she was so lucky to marry us. But if we fulfill our calling, she may feel blessed to have a husband that encourages her and says, I want you to follow Christ. I want you to do this. And by the way, you are. I love what you do. It's amazing to watch you raise our children and minister in the home and encourage people in the church and reach out to people who are in need. It's amazing. It's awesome what you do. It shouldn't be a chore. It's a privilege to be able to have a front row seat to an amazing woman who is truly excellent. God has called us as husbands to honor her excellence. And we should do that every day. Now, wives, I'm going to say something tongue-in-cheek, and I hope that you appreciate it. Yes, we all understand from Ephesians that the husband is the head of the home. The woman is the neck that turns the head. Yes, yes, no, all my ladies, you just let me down here. I understand. Here's the reality, if we can get biblical. Proverbs 31 is actually the climax of the book of Proverbs. It is a poem of praise for the ideal woman. In fact, she's a role model. She's virtuous. She's strong. She's a woman of strength. And by the way, the ideal woman is strong. But in what ways? Well, this final poem goes on to say how she works hard. She makes money. uh, She's kind to the poor. She's fearless about the future. She enhances her husband's reputation. She speaks with wisdom and a whole bunch more. In fact, This poem was so important, it's actually an acrostic. If we all spoke Hebrew, we would see that the 22 verses left in Proverbs chapter 31 are all, uh, they go through one by one the Hebrew alphabet right in order. Kind of like Psalm 119, if you're familiar with that. And many believe that this acrostic was used to help Jewish parents teach their sons and daughters how to be the people they needed to be for God and to live the lives that they should in their home. But for the sake of time and for summary purposes, verse 17 sums all this up. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. So she's a strong person. And in her strength, 
She's not competing with her husband. She's not worried about identity uh, politics or crises. She's beyond that. But what she does do is she gives herself, and I would add very, very often sacrificially, she gives herself to her family. And she even goes further. She gives herself to her community, and it's all wholeheartedly selfless. She has high standards, and she sticks to them, right? She's a woman of quality. And by the way, that woman of quality is hard to find, and don't take my word for it. Take, take uh, uh, the queen mothers. Who can find a virtuous woman, she asks in verse number 10, for her price is far above rubies. Now, here's the reality. Proverbs chapter 14 <clears throat> in verse 1, a wife will do one of two things. She will either build up her home or she will tear it down. Now, if she walks with the Lord, she will be a builder. But if she disobeys wisdom, she will be a destroyer. We can look in Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 4, uh, which explains that a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is rottenness in his bones. This comes down to two things, ladies. You will be a crown on the head of your husband, or you will be a cancer. You will be rottenness in his bones. And that is a choice. It's not prophesying. It's just describing the choice in front of you. Crown or cancer. One or the other. You have a choice. Now, children, <clears throat> I would be remiss if I did not address any of the children in here. Proverbs chapter 15, chapter 20, and, verse, and chapter 23 say these, make these statements. A wise son maketh a glad father. But a foolish man despiseth his mother. Whoso curseth his father or his mother, his lamp shall be put out in obscure darkness. <laughs> thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and they shall bear, and they that bear thee shall rejoice. Now I do admit I probably shouldn't have read those because if uh, you're put in obscure, uh, an obscure darkness, if you just keep reading, it means that your parents are rejoicing that you put in obscure darkness. So, <clears throat> pardon me. Let me put the cookies on the bottom shelf. Parents, state the obvious, are older and more experienced. Hence, hence, they are the ones that are the loving guides. There are many children. Let me say a couple of things. There are children who try to parent their parents. And if your parents, uh, uh, well, first, that's not what God ordained. There is a God-ordained order. And God has taken parents, and he has committed them with the charge to teach and lead their parents. It's never, ever the other way around. Children, if you are parenting your parents, you are in sin. Secondly, some children had to become parents because their parents manipulated them and coerced them through a dysfunctional family. Now, time fails me to address that in full. But parents, if you are making your children to be more responsible than they ought to be at their age, you are doing the wrong things. And if you have questions about it, you can see, you can see me afterwards. You cannot utilize dysfunction in your home and role reversals simply to appease your selfishness or your laziness or your own desires and put off on the children the things that you should be responsible for. Now, <clears throat> the key verses here teach us that we, that children, should not despise or curse their parents. And this is the way of wisdom. And it's specifically found in the fifth commandment. Honor thy father and thy mother. That's Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12. Now, the command not to despise and not to curse uh, is on the heels of honor your parents. That command applies as long as we live, you can get married and you do not outgrow honoring your parents. Okay? After you leave the home, you do not outgrow honoring your parents. If you were a victim of abuse or neglect in your home, you still find a way to honor your parents. Yes, it's difficult, and you can talk to me about that afterwards. What is God saying? To despise our parents is to treat them as worthless. God doesn't even look at them as worthless despite their indiscrepancies, despite their insufficiencies. 
God never looks at anybody as worthless. We can't look at our parents that way. To curse our parents does not mean that we swear at them, <clears throat> but it's similar to despise. It's, though, it's like we treat them as though they are beneath us, like we're better than them. That is sin. To honor our parents them, then is to look at them as people who are weighty in knowledge, whether you always agree with them or not, whether you argue with them sometimes. By the way, that's called normal arguments are normal. They may not always be healthy or productive, but they do happen. And praise God, he's found a way for us to, by wisdom, resolve those conflicts if we are so wise to follow in his way. But parents are weighty in knowledge, and they are worthy of that honor. They have gone above and beyond what we could ever imagine until we ourselves become parents and find out what it really feels like to raise kids. So here's one thing I'll tell you to stop doing, and I'll tell you another thing to start doing. Stop blaming them for their failures. They will fail. If they haven't already, they will. They will fail again if they already have. They're not perfect. And whatever successes you are enjoying, whatever benefits you've had as a result of your parents' investment, thank them for that. It does not matter how old you are. Thank them. Because when you grow up, you will decide to do some things differently than your parents did. Everyone does it. Everyone in here is doing something different than the way their parents did. But you know what else? Everyone in here is doing something that their parents did when you grew up. Even if it seems insignificant. Now, if, you're, if your parents are Christians, let me advise you in this in the vein of Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7. Imitate them. And the text there says, remember them which have the rule over you. <clears throat> who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Now, I will admit generational dysfunction is a real issue. And some people have chosen to break that dysfunction at great cost to themselves and through great pain. But let me tell you what every Christian parent wants. They want to reproduce the faith in the lives of their children and thus in the lives of their future home. Despite their imperfections, they want to revere the Bible. They want to live by faith. They want to take the light of Jesus Christ, carry it with them, burning and bright, and pass it on to the next generation of Christians into that next home who will raise a new generation in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So train up a child. What does that mean? Dedicate yourself to Jesus Christ. Husbands, cultivate your wives. Wives, crown your husbands. Both of you nurture your children and kids when they're old and they see your lifestyle. They'll have acquired those personalities and traits and characteristics and they will not depart. Father, we thank you for your word and your promise. Help us to make this a reality in our life. Do those things, do the work in our hearts that require us to listen, to submit and to obey and be glorified within our homes, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Um, I do have one announcement, and it's for the uh, young, uh, the young family uh, life group. Uh, give me one second here. Uh, the young family life group, that's this Saturday uh, at the Browns house. And hold on a second. I'm checking all sorts of different. What time is that, brother? Oh, stand by. <laughs> um, hold on. Four o'clock. All right. Yeah, perfect. If, if it wasn't four before, it's four now. All right. <clears throat> so I'm giving you a heads up so you can take off if you need to. All right. So 350, you just split. Um, let's see. Uh, please RSVP by Friday. I have the gate code. Um, let's see. Kids uh, can bring bathing suits or clothes to get wet in. There will be kayaking in the pond and food will be provided. And if you need the address to the Browns house, I have it. Brandon has it if he's willing to disclose that. And uh, that's this, uh, this Saturday. Um, I think that's it for now. If you're doing graduation Sunday, please uh, register, let Lisa know. And I believe that's everything. Does anybody have anything else? Going once, going twice? All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and thank you for truth. Thank you for this community of believers. Help us, Lord, knit our hearts together. Help us to love and encourage one another and help us as we invest our lives in you in our lives and our children and our homes. God, I pray that that light would shine throughout this church and throughout this community, that your 
uh, that you would be glorified for your worthy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. We'll see you next time.